giving someone advice on supplementing vitamin D without mentioning Good afternoon friends! In this video you will learn how supplementing magnesium can change your vitamin D levels, both raising your vitamin D levels and lowering it. But before you learn about that, please subscribe to the channel if you're not already, like the video and comment on the video to help the channel's growth. Now let's get started. First of all, I want to mention to you guys that I am still doing this series. I don't want to quit on it for the subscribers that do enjoy the series. So I'm trying to space out these videos. Oh, by the way, these videos belong to a vitamin D series, which you can access on my playlist. I'm going to space them out a little bit so that they don't bother too many other people. And we're going to continue where we left off here. If you recall, in the last video, we learned that magnesium modulates some of these activities also. We learned specifically that the calcium to magnesium ratio among foods you consume uh, is very important and modulates your health and specifically that the calcium to magnesium ratio should probably be about the number two for you. That means you consume twice as much calcium as you do magnesium but not much more than that. In this video, we're going to address not the direct relationship between calcium and magnesium, but the relationship that we know of so far in 2022 between magnesium and vitamin D. I'm going to be very comprehensive here, even though it won't give us a complete understanding. It will be useful. You'll learn that supplementing magnesium has direct impacts on our vitamin D status, and magnesium is an essential component of our program to optimize vitamin D in our bodies. Now let's get started. In this video, you will learn about magnesium's two most important important roles in regarding to vitamin D. That is its modulation of parathyroid hormone, the response that elevates when you have low vitamin D status, and its activity as an enzymatic cofactor for vitamin D synthesis enzymes and as a cofactor for vitamin D binding proteins. Those are the two main effects of magnesium for vitamin D. You will learn how magnesium intake impacts vitamin D status in people and how magnesium intake can sometimes be sufficient and sometimes necessary to have sufficient vitamin D status. And also we will learn how magnesium impacts the diseases that vitamin D protects against. Those are cardiovascular disease to a lesser degree, cardiovascular disease, but mainly cancers as well as bone mineral density issues. That is the risk of osteomalacia, the softening of the bones, in the extreme case rickets that happens with supposedly only with vitamin D deficiency. First, we have to talk about the parathyroid hormone response. Remember that when we have low vitamin D levels, parathyroid hormone rises. In the process, it causes this reduction of bone mineral density. But parathyroid hormone only rises when we're also deficient in calcium. If you're consuming enough calcium, parathyroid hormone doesn't rise. But also, if you're consuming too little calcium, but you're consuming enough magnesium, parathyroid hormone's rise can also be attenuated. So magnesium is another backup plan to low vitamin D levels. First, it's vitamin D, then calcium, then magnesium. If calcium is sufficient, magnesium doesn't produce any effect on parathyroid hormone. But if calcium is also deficient, then magnesium protects you against the rises in parathyroid hormone that end up contributing to the osteomalacia that is caused in vitamin D deficiency. Next, magnesium is essential for the activity of the enzymes that synthesize vitamin D. You'll recall that there are different enzymes, 25-hydroxylase, 1-alpha-hydroxylase, and 24-hydroxylase, which synthesize the liver metabolite, the kidney metabolite, and the inactive metabolite of vitamin D, respectively. All of these enzymes cannot function without magnesium. They use magnesium as a cofactor, and it seems to be the case that natural level fluctuation in magnesium levels significantly impacts the activity of those enzymes. But magnesium is also used for the vitamin D binding protein. Protein, and without it, the vitamin D binding protein, which distributes vitamin D around your body and is essential for its activity and whose activity fluctuates between ethnicities, cannot function properly. So you need magnesium to be able to go through the full synthesis for vitamin D and you need magnesium to be able to distribute vitamin D across your body. Next, to understand how magnesium supplementation affects our vitamin D levels, we have to examine an excellent study from 2018. This randomized controlled trial 
was the first study to show a number of things. To begin, the participants had an average calcium to magnesium ratio of around 2.6, a higher level. None had below 2.6. And what happened was they tried to dose magnesium among these participants such that their calcium to magnesium ratio becomes more favorable. It lowers, in their case, they aim for 2.3. Remember, we spoke of a range of between 1.7 to maybe 2.5 or 2.6 being ideal deal in terms of calcium consumption to magnesium consumption. So what they did in the study was increase the amount of magnesium so that the balance between the two elements was changed. What they found was that when they supplemented magnesium to people whose vitamin D levels were high, that is between 30 and 50 nanograms per deciliter, the magnesium could reduce their vitamin D levels. It could reduce it, to be clear. And when they supplemented the same magnesium to people whose vitamin D levels were below 30 nanograms per deciliter, a little bit on the lower side of the scale, they, these people experienced increases in their vitamin D level from magnesium supplementation. What that means is that magnesium supplementation affects our vitamin D levels differentially, depending on whether we have low vitamin D levels or not. If we have low levels, supplementing magnesium by itself can raise those levels. If we have high levels, supplementing magnesium can sort of, it seems to be, protect us from those high levels, lowering the vitamin D levels. So for the first time ever, this study showed that magnesium supplementation could potentially protect people from the dangers of hypervitaminosis D, that is having too high levels of vitamin D. And it's also the first paper that showed that in humans, magnesium supplementation could differentially regulate vitamin D levels in a consistent manner, such that when they had low vitamin D levels, it would raise it, and when they had high vitamin D levels, it would lower it, modulating our vitamin D levels in humans. Now, why might this differential effect on vitamin D levels happen? Well, if you have lower vitamin D levels, you may have less of that last enzyme that converts the active kidney metabolite into the inactive active metabolite of vitamin D. So the addition of magnesium may impact that degrading enzyme less if you have lower levels. Whereas if you have higher levels of vitamin D, you may have more availability of that degrading enzyme, which can then, its activity can then be enhanced much more with magnesium supplementation. So through its differential effects on enzymes, magnesium probably modulates our vitamin D levels. Now, magnesium is also sufficient by itself to improve vitamin D levels in humans. A recent randomized control trial in women found that magnesium supplementation by itself could increase their vitamin D levels. So magnesium is actually sufficient to modulate vitamin D. And it is sometimes also necessary. In some trials, blood vitamin D levels could not be optimized in the absence of magnesium supplementation. And in fact, there's a kind of rickets. Remember, rickets being the deficiency disease of vitamin D, the disease in which there's a softening of the bones. There's a kind of rickets called vitamin D resistant rickets, tellingly. And though normally calcium supplementation will improve that situation, magnesium supplementation does also. In vitamin D resistant rickets, while an injection of 600,000 units of vitamin D cannot heal the rickets or reverse the condition, magnesium supplementation can. Also, in states of magnesium deficiency in humans, they have a lessened activity of the active kidney metabolite of vitamin D. And finally, PTH expression, that is parathyroid hormone, which elevates in the case of low vitamin D levels, parathyroid hormone is inversely associated with vitamin D levels in the obese only when they have enough magnesium in them. When they don't, the higher level of vitamin D doesn't lower the parathyroid hormone response as well in obese people. In fact, speaking of parathyroid hormone response, let's get into cancer. So magnesium is also very protective for cancers. It's recently been discovered that colorectal cancer incidence appears to be the lowest in people who have both optimized, so-called optimized vitamin D status and optimized parathyroid hormone status. Both seem to matter. And for that reason, magnesium may protect against colorectal cancer through its modulation of parathyroid hormone. In fact, in a 2020 study on colorectal cancer, it was found that calcium levels were not associated with colorectal cancer outcome or reoccurrence. However, those with the best vitamin D levels and the best magnesium levels were the most protected from colorectal cancer. 
not the ones with the best calcium levels, but rather the ones with the best magnesium and vitamin D levels. So it seems magnesium and vitamin D go together in the protection of essentially ass cancer. While an examination of a 2019 study on cancers found that calcium intake was inversely associated with cancer incidence, this calcium intake was protective only at the right calcium to magnesium ratios, where magnesium intake was a bit higher than the normal intake of Americans. Americans consume, you'll remember, too much calcium for too little magnesium. When the magnesium is raised, the calcium seems to be more protective for cancers. And fascinatingly, an analysis of the 2019 National Health Survey and Examination Report found that exercise was inversely associated with cancer mortality only in people that were not magnesium deficient and had the right calcium to magnesium ratio of between 1.7 to 2.5 or so. So magnesium protects against cancers specifically by the way it modulates this vitamin C calcium magnesium axis. But does magnesium also protect us from cardiovascular disease? It certainly does. Specifically with regard, it may protect us from more than one thing regarding cardiovascular disease. We'll get into that properly in the magnesium series. But here, what's particularly evident is that supplementing magnesium reduces the incidence of calcification of the blood vessels. You'll remember that uh, inflammation in your blood vessels can lead to soft tissue calcification in the blood vessels. And this calcification is usually an indicator of a healing process occurring in someone's diseased arteries and blood vessels. But it can also happen due to, not due to disease, but due to having too much calcification generally in your body. Somebody like that, for example, if they get hit on the ear or on some soft tissue, painfully, they may develop calcification. They're faster than other people. These same people will develop faster calcification of their blood vessels as a response to stress in the blood vessels, including deposition of uh, lipid particles, but also just hypertension in the blood vessels, which could be episodic, like when you're weightlifting, for example. So this is a serious issue. Uh, magnesium supplementation, let's first look at animal studies. In animal studies, magnesium can dose-dependently reduce the calcification of soft tissue in the vascular structure. And it does so by modulating the changes in osteogenic transformations there, and by inhibiting inhibiting the deposition and development of what are called hydroxyapatite particles, which are part of this calcium buildup. Specifically, hydroxyapatite forms about 50 to 70% of our bone tissue. In animals, magnesium supplementation can dose-dependently inhibit the formation of these particles, and it can also reverse the process of calcification in the blood vessels. Specifically, it can reverse it fascinatingly. Remember the clotho gene that I mentioned a couple of episodes ago that was involved in the kidney reabsorption of calcium and phosphate? Mice that are transgenic, that have that gene deleted from them, their clotho KO, develop calcification in their arteries that can be attenuated with magnesium supplementation that can inhibit pathologic osteoblast formation. Osteoblasts are the uh, parts of our body that create bone, whereas osteoclasts break down bone. Blast creates them, clast breaks them down, and osteo is related to bone. There's something turning into bone, for example, is called ossification, just to establish these terms. This is also all established in humans also. Magnesium can also do all of this in humans. We should look at a 2019 randomized control trial on people with chronic kidney disease who had calcification of their vascular structure. Naturally, in the later stages of chronic kidney disease, phosphate levels, remember phosphate is also a mineral that we consume in foods like calcium. Phosphate levels rise, and this rise in phosphate levels can be accompanied by improved absorption of, cal of phosphate because of vitamin D. So phosphate levels rise, and hyperphosphatinemia, I don't even know how that's pronounced to be honest, but too high phosphate levels play a causal role in cardiovascular disease and in the calcification of blood vessels. Although two previous studies on hemodialysis patients, uh, human studies, were promising, this study that I'm mentioning now was the most insightful. In this study, magnesium oxide supplementation could slow down the calcification of these arteries in humans. In fact, although magnesium supplementation didn't reduce thoracic aorta calcification, it did reduce, attenuate the progression of CAC score 
So much so that the authors of the paper actually said it retarded the progression of the calcification of blood vessels, which means it totally halted it. And this makes sense because low magnesium is a risk factor among people with chronic kidney disease for the development of peripheral artery disease. That's the disease that Flex Wheeler, the bodybuilder, developed and probably caused him to have to amputate his leg. So what are the mechanisms by which magnesium can protect against the calcification of our arteries? Well, they're not completely understood yet. One of the things that's been observed is that magnesium supplementation clearly reduces the formation of calciprotein particles that include hydroxyapatite formation. These are the essential building blocks of the calcification of soft tissue. But it's also known that magnesium, depending on someone's magnesium status and calcium status, magnesium can encourage the activity of osteoclasts that break down bone and discourage the activity of osteoblasts that develop new bone. But this depends again on your magnesium status, calcium status, vitamin D status, and so on. But the point is the magnesium can modulate the activity of those two key factors in the transformation of your bone over time. Magnesium also acts via its ability to inhibit some of the phosphate binding in the intestines, reducing our absorption of phosphate. And also, of course, magnesium can act as a natural calcium channel blocker and surely exert some of its protective effects on the calcification of soft tissue here. In studies, as I said, magnesium supplementation can uh, not only halt, honestly, the calcification of vascular tissue, it can reverse it. It can actually reverse the calcification in soft tissue, which is striking. On the other hand, there is disagreement among academics about whether magnesium supplementation can produce a pathologic reduction in calcification. That means, okay, we know magnesium seems to protect us from the calcification of soft tissue, but can it also limit the amount of calcification of bone that we actually need, can it harm that as well? There's a little bit of disagreement here. It seems at physiologic levels of magnesium, it rarely exerts that negative effect where it breaks down bone that we want. But this isn't always true and there's disagreement on the subject. My conclusion personally is that in normal situations, magnesium preferentially reduces pathologic calcification more than it reduces healthy cal calcification because it's an integral part of the system and uh, enough magnesium levels are supposed to be there for non-pathologic activity to happen. So normally I think that it will act in a non-pathologic fashion but in the cases of maybe a too low of a ratio of calcium to magnesium or in cases of uh, vitamin D deficiency combined with magnesium excess I do think that magnesium supplementation could also also weaken bones. But I don't think this is a very realistic concern for us unless somebody is mega dosing magnesium, has an unusual diet, and is also probably getting low amounts of vitamin D. So I wouldn't worry too much about this for now. Next, we should talk about the effects on non-pathologic bone, that is our real skeletons. How does magnesium consumption affect our skeletal health? That is not the calcification of soft tissue, but the normal skeletal health. Well, first of all, in rodents, extreme deficiencies of magnesium eventually cause a softening of the bones by itself. In humans, this is less clear. For example, in an observational study on women, it was found that the women with magnesium deficiency, with the lowest levels of magnesium, had increased fracture risk. But also those women with the highest amounts of magnesium also experienced increased fracture risk, specifically on their wrists and the lower parts of their arms. The authors theorized that this is because women who have the highest levels of magnesium may be the most physically active. Although I think that very high levels of magnesium could increase fracture risk on their own if everything else is right. In the elderly, low magnesium levels are associated with worse bone mineral density. So generally speaking, I think at physiologic levels, lower magnesium levels will be worse for your bone health. It's uh, really a unique situation to allow magnesium to decrease bone health in humans, in my opinion. But let's look at some control trials as well. First of all, in a control trial of people who have osteoporosis, two years of magnesium supplementation can not only halt the worsening bone mineral density of these people, so their bones are getting progressively worse with time, it not only halts that, but it can actually increase their bone mineral density over time. Unlike vitamin D, vitamin D doesn't do this for these people. In menopausal women, magnesium supplementation could decrease their parathyroid hormone expression by up to seven times and increase their osteocalcin expression. By the way, that's a protein dependent on vitamin D that is involved in the formation of bone by over five times. So 
magnesium has a tremendous effect, it seems to be, on the markers that we associate with better bone health. But also magnesium deficiency, even in the cases of calcium sufficiency, produces a softening of the enamel, the outside layer of people's teeth, making their teeth less resistant to acids. I have this problem myself. I have a low amount of enamel on my teeth. It seems to be that even in cases of calcium sufficiency, people will develop that if they don't have enough magnesium. For most of my life, I have a low amount of enamel on my teeth personally, and I've had a probably a high ratio of calcium to magnesium consumption most of my life, which leads me to think that I may have been partly to blame for my, the sensitivity of my teeth. Anyway, friends, this video is getting quite long. Let's review what we learned in it with some key takeaways. First of all, magnesium is a backup for your body. It backs you up in the case that you have too low vitamin D levels and it backs you up in case you have too low calcium levels. Also, magnesium is an essential cofactor in the enzymes that synthesize vitamin D and in the binding protein that moves vitamin D, vitamin D around your body. So sub giving someone advice on supplementing vitamin D without mentioning magnesium, for example, a lot of people mention vitamin D and vitamin K by themselves without mentioning magnesium is really ridiculous. They come together. Calcium, uh, magnesium, and vitamin K and vitamin D all go together. You can't have a recommendation for one without the others. Next, we learned that supplementing magnesium can increase or decrease your vitamin D levels depending on whether they are low or high and specifically that it moves the vitamin D level to a point that is probably optimal for you or better for you than the last point was. Next, magnesium supplementation affects your vitamin D level differently depending on whether you have low vitamin D or high vitamin D. Generally, it improves the area that your vitamin D level is. So if it's too high, it protects you from that and if it's too low, it also protects you from that. It also seems to be that people are most protected from cancers like colorectal cancer when they have the right ratio of calcium to magnesium and when they are sufficient in calcium, magnesium, and vitamin D. And finally, magnesium protects you from cardiovascular disease. It protects you from the pathologic calcification of your blood vessels. And it also improves your bone mineral density, except in odd cases where somebody is deficient in vitamin D and also deficient in calcium, but supplementing very excessively with magnesium, in which case it may actually soften someone's bones. I hope this was helpful for your friends. We're being rigorous. We're going to continue with another episode in a few days on my vitamin D series. I look forward to seeing you then.